Good morning. We continue with our series, Handling Life Pressures. Before we start our part seven, we'll listen to our theme song. Our topic this morning for a part 7 of the series is Becoming Resilient, Overcoming and Growing from Failures and Faults. Vincent van Gogh, Albert Einstein, Colonel Harland Sanders, Walt Disney, Shoichira Honda. What do these people have? In common. During his lifetime, Van Gogh sold only one painting, and this was to a friend and only for a very small amount of money. Despite his challenging circumstances, Van Gogh plugged on with painting, sometimes disturbing to complete his over 800 known works. Today, some are worth hundreds of millions of dollars each. Albert Einstein is considered one of the greatest thinkers of our time. He did not speak until he was four years old. He failed his entrance exams to the Swiss Federal Polytechnic School at 16 years old. Even his father, up until the time of his death, considered his son to be a major failure. After eventually graduating from college, Einstein actually worked as an insurance salesman, but quit after some time because he failed at that as well. Colonel Harlan Sanders was the late founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC restaurants. Throughout his entire life, he failed in just about every endeavor he was involved in. However, at the age of 65, he set out with his famous chicken recipe and only a $105 social security check to his name in an attempt to sell his franchise chicken model. 1,009 restaurants rejected him before one accepted his offer. Soikiro Honda, the late founder of Honda Motor Company, dealt with an enormous amount of failure. In 1937, at the time of the Great Depression, Honda founded a company in an attempt to create piston rings for Toyota. He failed, having to pawn his wife's wedding ring just to stay afloat. His first factory was bombed during World War II. The second factory was destroyed a short time after by an earthquake. Walt Disney is a creative genius who brought us the likes of Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Snow White. Yet, he faced many failures. His first company, Laugh of Gram, went bankrupt. It was not until five years later, and plenty of heartaches, after he created Mickey Mouse, did he begin to experience a small amount of success and fame. To answer the question we raised earlier, 
the common feature among the five persons mentioned is what we call resilience. What is resilience? What do we mean when we talk about it? The term resilience comes from two Latin words, namely re, which means back, and salire, which means to jump or to leap. From its etymology, resilience then means to rebound, to recoil. We can name a number of examples of resilience in the natural world. The bamboo demonstrates resilience in terms of its flexibility and it is often the last plant left standing in high winds. A rubber band can be stretched to many times its normal length and yet it bounces back. An oak tree loses its leaves in the harsh winter but its roots go deeper in the ground to survive and when spring comes it flourishes. A simple definition of resilience runs this way. It is the ability to resist, to absorb, and to recover from or successfully adapt to adversity or change. According to the Webster Dictionary, the definition of being resilient is being capable of withstanding shock without permanent deformation or rupture and tending to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. When people refuse to give up on themselves and the world, even after misfortunes, they are being resilient. When people don't wallow or dwell on failures, when they acknowledge the situation, when they learn from their mistakes, and then they move forward, they are being resilient. Being resilient does not mean that a person is unaffected or uncaring about the life changes. Being resilient is not about trying to carry on regardless of how we feel. Instead, being resilient is about first understanding why we feel the way we do and second, we develop strategies to help us deal with situations more effectively rising above them. Being resilient does not make a person immune from stress or hardships. Rather, having resilience means that we experience and think about stress, difficulties, and hardships differently. Resilience gives us the ability to find meaning in the challenges life brings over our way and to bounce back from them and even becoming better in the process. Resilient people never think of themselves as victims of circumstances. They never give up. They are never quitters. Resilient people focus their time and energy and changing things that they have control over. Now we go to a question regarding resilience. How is resilience treated in the Bible? In the Bible, resilience is the norm. By norm, we mean it is something that is usual, it is something that is typical, it's something that is standard, which is demonstrated by God's people in their lives. We quote 
Proverbs 24, 16 as follows. For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. End of quote. Possibly this verse may lay out the theme verse for resilience. In Philippians 3, the Apostle Paul wrote in verses 13 to 15, and I quote, Brethren, I count not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. The Apostle Paul admonishing believers to press on amid setbacks. Philippians 3 verses 13 to 15. In his letter, the Apostle James wrote, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that loveth him. James 1.12, as he counsels believers to persevere in the face of life trials. Why is resilience a biblical norm? Meaning, why is it that it, can, it is considered typical and usual trait? This is not difficult to understand. In the area of our life, all of us will have setbacks and disappointments. From these setbacks and disappointments, we fail or we fall in one or so things eventually. Anyone who attempts anything will make mistakes. This is part of life. Michael Jordan, the famous American basketball player, is reported to have said, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I have been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Michael Jordan speaking. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill once said, Success is never final. Failure is never fatal. It is courage that counts. U.S. General George S. Patton was known to say that it is not how far you fall that matters. It's how high you bounce when you hit bottom. Thomas Edison also said, Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Just as we can turn earthly life setbacks into a springboard for secular success, so also in achieving our God-given talents and responsibilities, we can turn these life setbacks into springboards. The Bible gives valuable insights into 
using our failures and faults as springboards to achieving and fulfilling our God-given missions. Resilience enabled biblical personalities not to give in to defeat and continue to pursue God's purposes in spite of different difficult challenges. In the Old Testament, Job demonstrated great resilience. After losing everything, Job was in great agony of soul and body, yet he refused to curse the Lord or give up. In all this, he said, he did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Later, when the suffering intensified, Job's wife counseled him to curse God and die. But Job would not even consider such a thing. For his resilience out of his difficulties, God honored Job. Moreover, resilience enabled God's people in the Bible to be undeterred from their mission regardless of the opposition. Take the case of Paul. Paul showed great resilience after his life-altering encounter with Jesus. He was beaten, he was stoned, he was criticized, he was jailed, and he was nearly killed many times. For example, in Lystra in Asia Minor, he was stoned, dragged out of town, and left for dead. But when his enemies left, Paul simply got up and went back into the city. His missionary endeavors continued unabated. Paul showed great resilience. We have a long list of biblical personalities who exhibited resilience, failing and falling, but bouncing back to serve God at higher levels. For example, we have David who bounced back after adultery. We have Daniel who bounced back after the lion's den. We have Sedrach Mesca and Abernego bounced back after the fiery furnace. Also, we have Jacob bouncing back after wrestling with the angel. We also have Noah who bounced back after the flood. We also have Abraham who bounced back after offering Isaac. All these people were able to bounce back from their falls and failures. And after bouncing back, they grew in their resilience and were to serve God in greater responsibilities and doing these responsibilities much better. What enabled these people to overcome, to bounce back, and even do better things for God? Through God's grace. By God's grace, they were not destroyed by adversities. By God's grace, they were much more at peace in the midst of the storms. By God's grace, they were able to persevere well and grew in the process. The foundation to resilience, as demonstrated by the biblical personalities we mentioned, is faith in God. This is the major insight we can derive from these resilient biblical personalities. Psalm 37, verse 23-24 tells us, 
and I quote, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Psalm 37 verses 23 to 24. It is from God from whom Job derived his resilience when experiencing great hardships. In Job 42 verses 1 to 2, Job acknowledged as follows. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst be, do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Job 42 verses 1 to 2. It is from God from whom Peter derived resilience after stumbling badly many times with great shame in the eyes of many. Peter testified in his second letter, and I quote, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Second Peter 1 3. It's also from God from whom Paul derived great resilience when he met up with Jewish resistance. And his resilience came when he heard the Lord whisper, and I quote, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half in Corinth, teaching them the Word of God. Acts 18, verses 9 to 11. In truth, it is from God from whom our Lord Jesus Christ derived resilience when He resurrected from the dead, showing everyone His power to defeat the world, the flesh, the devil, and even death through His resurrection power. Our Lord Jesus Christ said to His disciples, All power in heaven and earth is given to me. Go make disciples of all nations. Truly, resilience is upheld by God's power. In his letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 9. Let's pause for this intermission song. When I am down and all oh, my soul so weary when troubles come and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up.
when I am on your shoulders, you raise me up to more than I can be. Our relationship with Christ assures us of the availability of all resources we need to be resilient amidst our failures and faults. Let's now identify the factors which hinder us in situations when we need to be resilient, when we need to persevere, when we need to overcome, when we need to bounce back, and when we need to grow. We have four factors. First, we have fear. Second, we have insecurity and inadequacy. Third, rejecting responsibility and control. And fourth, myopic perspective. Because of our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, Instead of fear in the face of all these challenging circumstances, we have faith in God. Instead of insecurity and inadequacy, we have our identity with Christ. Instead of rejecting control over our circumstances, we assume responsibility because of our connectedness with Christ. And last, instead of earthly and myopic perspective, we adopt eternal perspective because of our relationship with Christ. Now let's tackle the first factor. The first resource available to us in times when we need resilience, faith instead of fear. Oftentimes in the midst of failures and falls, we become disappointed, we become discouraged, and even desperate. We ask ourselves, if God has allowed this to happen, what else might He allow? We might also be tempted to say, God has abandoned me and no one understands or wants to help me in this current situation of mine. As a result, because of these thoughts, we allow fear to creep into us. We allow fear to immobilize us. Indeed, the major enemy of resilience is the incorrect assumption that we know how things will end. When a situation seems out of control or does not appear to be headed in the right direction, we tend to write the end over the story. We think we know the final result. So instead of exercising resilience, we give up or take matters into our own hands. Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 is a good biblical passage to cling to whenever we can see only disaster ahead. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Choosing to trust in the Lord, rather than rely on what we understand, is the best way to stay resilient. One of the greatest statements of faith in the entire Bible is found in the book of Daniel when Daniel's three friends were given the choice 
of either worshiping the idol or being thrown into the fire. The response demonstrated their great faith as stated in Daniel 3 verses 17 to 8 and I quote, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Daniel 3, verses 17 to 8. This is the same faith we have in the midst of challenging circumstances. We walk with God and believe that God will take us through every adversity, even in times of our setbacks and fall. The second factor, identity versus insecurity and inadequacy. Oftentimes, when we face setbacks and failures, we indulge into self-pity. We say, poor me, why does everything happen to me? We also are tempted to say, I have failed, I am a failure. Or another statement, I am no longer in a position to face the challenge to rise from the ashes, so to speak. Against all these negative notions of insecurity and inadequacy, the Apostle Paul assures us in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Him, referring to Christ, who gives me strength. Truly, the biblical reality is that in Christ, as Paul again confirms in Romans 8, verse 37, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Romans 8, 37. Now let's go to the third factor. Assuming responsibility instead of resigning. In the face of setbacks and failures, we avoid responsibility and forsake control. Instead of taking personal responsibility to do what we can under the circumstances, we escape into the fog of avoidance or go through the blame game. We condemn ourselves and say, I'm useless, I always fail, it's always my fault. Anger, resentment, or bitterness toward God and others. We state, I have a right to be angry because they did this to me. Often we give up far too early and too easily. Let us learn valuable lesson from Paul regarding this. And we quote, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we are pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and that deliver, in whom we trust, that he will yet deliver us. He also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us, by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. 
Paul writing his second letter to the Corinthians 1 verses 8 to 11. Let us not therefore use the negative situations around us as excuses. With God's help, let us assume responsibility over our circumstances. In Acts, the consistent habit of the early church was to respond to adversity with responsible action. They never backed down because of intimidation, fear, or discouragement. In Acts 4, they were commanded to stop preaching the gospel, and yet they responded with even more boldness in prayer. The apostles and Paul were under so much stress and faced so much imminent danger that in their own strength, they could not have survived. But they did not fall down and fail. They looked at God and by God's grace, they found new strength and even deliverance. The early church never backed down. Even when their strength was little, they kept moving ahead. They were resilient. They trusted God and did whatever they could do to serve Him. So we don't give up. Even when it looks bad, God is still with us. Now we go to the fourth factor. We have eternal instead of earthly perspective. When faced with seemingly insurmountable challenges, our myopic and earthly perspective tell us what just happened to shoots. It is the end of the world. Things are hopeless, we say. We also say we give up. There's nothing we can do. In reality, instead of being overwhelmed with the severity of the circumstances, let us focus on what awaits us in eternity and temporariness of events that are occurring. In 2 Corinthians 4.17, the Apostle Paul wrote, and I quote, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. End of quote. When we see things from the eternal viewpoint, we respond to the situation as follows. What just happened is bad, but in reality, it's only a small thing. It's not the end of the world, and from the perspective of eternity, it's very small indeed. In short, with God's help, we see things as they really are. The truth is, God will soon bring these times of pain to an end. In Revelations 21 verse 4, it is written, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelations 21, verse 4. The truth is that even now, we are in Christ seated in a position of victory. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 6, 7, and we quote, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, verses 6 to 7. When we see things from an eternal perspective, we'll be able to respond with gratitude to God 
no matter what He allows us to experience. As we experience adversity of various kinds, we are to look at God and look at eternity. Then as we see things from His perspective, we'll be able to actually rejoice and we will not be destroyed by adversities. Philippians 4.4 4 states, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Now we ask a very important question relevant to our topic. What are the practical steps we can take in order to develop resilience? What are the steps we can take in order to be resilient, to overcome and grow from our faults and failures? What do we have to do in order to top the foundation together with the specific resources available to be resilient within biblical parameters? To do this, we can adopt three C approaches namely by being Christ-centered, second, by being conduct-consistent, and third, by being community-connected. Let's look at the first step, Christ-centered. As believers, we are called upon to cultivate the discipline of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. If we lock our eyes upon Jesus, we will find ourselves persevering, overcoming, and bouncing back in the midst of adverse circumstances. Thus, always, let us keep our perspective on the faithfulness of God. God promises to supply all our needs in times of our failures, in times of our falls. God is faithful to help us fail forward. Let's look at the step two, being conduct consistent. Resilience is just something that we are born with. Rather, it's something that is learned. It is something that is developed over our lifespan. Resilience is an essential life skill that helps us to bounce back from a variety of hardships, including illness, criticism, death, fear, anxiety, and depression. Because of Christ, we can always stand firm in full confidence of God's work through us. In the Bible, those who have gone through serious times of testing know fully well that Christ is able to faithfully strengthen them. This provided consistency in their conduct. One of the most difficult steps of our Christian lives is to get the truth of God transferred to our daily lives. We hear the truth, but very little of God's Word often penetrates into our own lives, much less applying them consistently. In this connection, we quote Nehemiah 5.9. So I said, the thing that you're doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? The Apostle Paul also wrote the same thought in Philippians 1.27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, 
striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The Apostle James also wrote in James 1.4, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If our conduct is so consistent with God's word, there is no doubt that we have all the necessary ingredients for resilience. Let's proceed to step three. It's about being community connected. Resilient people are socially connected. They understand the importance of connecting with others. People need people. When the troubles of life pounce upon us, our likelihood of bouncing back with resilience will be significantly increased when we are surrounded by people who care and love us. A support system is essential because these relationships provide us with necessary support and acceptance during difficult times. As followers of Jesus, we are called upon to live our lives in genuine fellowship with one another in order to cross-pollinate our knowledge of Jesus and the joy we derive from fellowship with Him. In reality, all of us experience adversities at times so severe that we fall and fail. No one of us escapes pain, fear, and suffering. Yet from pain can come wisdom, from fear can come courage, from suffering can come strength. If we develop resilience, meaning overcoming and drawing out of failures and faults. We may have failed in the past, but today is a new day. We can do it differently going forward. We can grow, we can change along the biblical resilience way. As we resolve to overcome and grow out of our failures and faults, let us be inspired by and internalize the message of our closing song, which gives us the assurance of the strongest foundation we need to be resilient even in the worst of situations. Let us now listen prayerfully to the song. Last night I had a dream. I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. And across the sky flashed scenes from my life. And for each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me, and the other to the Lord. And after the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. And I noticed that many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. Footprints in the sand He held me in His hand Someday I'll understand Footprints in the sand Now this really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and lowest times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. And I don't understand why when I needed you the most, you would leave me. And the Lord replied, my son, my precious child, 
I love you, and I would never leave you. During your times of suffering, when you could see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Footprints in the sand. He held me in his hand and gave me strength to face the coming day. At times I felt alone. I was never on my own. Someday I'll understand. Footprints in the sand. 